Uh, is it Mueller? Or... It's me, but I'm recording. Oh, hey, oh, hey, are, you, are you also like letting people in the waiting room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Mary Newberger, and I'm one of the co-hosts here of the Balkan Circle. I'm a professor in the Department of History and director for the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at UT Austin. I'm also the chair of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. Kirill is my co-host. Thank you very much. For those that do not know me, my name is Kirill Avramov. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. I'm a political scientist and also I'm the director of the Global Disinformation Lab, which is host uh, at the Center of Russian, Eastern European and Eurasian Studies at our uh, liberal college. But most importantly, at this point of time is that I'm a co-host of Professor Newberger at uh, our beloved Balkan Circle. Uh, and today uh, we have yet another very exciting talk by uh, Dr. Lazaros Karavasidis, uh, who has a PhD in comparative politics from the Department of Politics and International Studies in Loughborough University in UK. And his research project focuses on comparing right and left wing populism in Greece and Germany. So he is comparativist. Among his main academic interests are theoretical and empirical aspects of populism, political parties, discourse theory, as well as the connection between parties and movements. Uh, today talk, today's talk will be dedicated to the left-wing populism of Syriza and the successes and limitations during the uh, 2010s. And as we spoke, Lazarus, in the, in the brief chat before the uh, start of your lecture, uh, those years seems ages ago as we live in this extraordinary times when events uh, are so intense uh, that um, even such a recent historical period seems to be you know, far, far uh, back in time. However, um, we feel that uh, your talk will illuminate and um, provide our participants and us with uh, interesting information because as we spoke, um, some of the, the trends and tendencies that you work are not only applicable in, in Greek politics and Balkan politics, but they're usually a precursor of things to come as bigger debates within the European and Euro-Atlantic space. So without further ado, I would like to welcome you uh, as today's uh, speaker and guest of Balkan Circle, Lazarus. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Uh, I think the introduction that Kirill did was did not uh, leave anything else for the imagination. So there's nothing uh, else to, for me to add there. Uh, I would like uh, in my turn to thank you for hosting me here today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Neu uh, Neuberger and um, Kirill for hosting me today. I would also like to thank my friend Harala Bosminasidis who brought me in contact with you. And I'm really glad, as I said earlier, uh, to uh, talk to a different audience than the usual, let's say, European one. Uh, can you see the, the screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, just let me um, do the presentation from beginning. All right, perfect. Um, as Kirill very well mentioned, the historical, uh, let's say, time uh, seems to be uh, very contracted in some instances and in some other instances uh, become very condensed. For example, 2019 seems like it happened uh, 10 years ago when it's actually 2 and a half years ago. Uh, coronavirus seems to be a thing of the past. We have the war in Ukraine right now. So development seems to be changing very fast. So what I would like to present to you here today is practically 15, almost 15 years of uh, Greek politics through the prism of Syriza. And this reminds me, when I was preparing that presentation, it reminded me of what uh, Antonio Gramsci, the great Marxist uh, theoretic, uh, said about how a party, a political party, is the history of a country through one prism. The case of Syriza is the most, uh, let's say, the most exemplary part of that uh, quote. And 
what I will be say, uh, discussing with you today is not only how left-wing populism, uh, how po Syriza's left-wing populism uh, came to happen, what the form that it took, and how uh, it resonated with the Greek society and everything else, but I will be uh, discussing also through that Syriza's trajectory from the mid-2000s up until uh, last February in order to have a, a broader and yet more comprehensive understanding of Syriza, left-wing populism, and Greek politics during that time. Uh, Syriza originally started as an uh, electoral alliance between different parties, different uh, social movements and social fora, uh, parties that were minor of maybe social democratic origins, and radical left origins. Um, the, Differences were a little bit vast, but Syriza proved, uh, provided the opportunity for all these actors to come in together and present a coherent uh, a form that would be oriented towards the radical left. That, of course, came with its own difficulties. Having multiple actors uh, under, a, let's say, one platform is very different that on the on the one hand, it strengthens and promotes political pluralism because uh, those different movements, parties, and social fora discuss with each other through Syriza. Uh, but their disagreements were sometimes vast or even their actions were contradictory. So it was a balance. Syriza tried to be a balance between promoting political pluralism and on the other hand, uh, providing a coherent political program that would make Syriza a credible political force in the Greek party system of the time. Uh, to do so, Syriza started to provide, um, let's say, a new phase in the politics of Greece. And it did that through the centrality of youth in its discourse, that they were speaking primarily for the youth and about the youth. And uh, some scholars even state that this was the beginning of Syriza's populism, that instead of a people, what we usually see in populism, we had the youth. Um, but underneath that, uh, it was Syriza's attempt to find the footing, uh, to find its footing in the Greek society and resonate perhaps with the younger audience, with the new generation who were fed up with mainstream politics and with uh, the mainstream parties at the time, the center-left uh, PASOK uh, and the center-right New Democracy, who, were, who have been alternating in power for the past 25 years until that point. Uh, this was practically how uh, the first period of Syriza up until the late, the end of uh, 2009 can be summarized in. Um, Alexis Tsipras, who some of you may recognize him after being him after him being everywhere in the past uh, 10, 15 years in the Greek political scene. Uh, he was elected as a leader of uh, Syriza in 2008. Uh, and initially he had a lot of popularity in combination with that centrality of youth message uh, that promoted his appeal. But in the elections, the European Parliament elections, as well as the legislative elections of 2009, uh, Syriza proved to be a force that did not have the appeal that the uh, mate had wanted. Uh, to give you an example, the threshold to enter the Greek parliament for a party is 3%, and Syriza around that period was between 5, 4 and 6%. So as you can imagine, it did not attract a lot of voters back then. However, uh, things were about to quickly change. And I'm going to take a small detour to explain what happened during the Greek debt crisis, especially the part of 2010-2012. Um, on April 2010, uh, the Greek government, uh, led by BASOK uh, at that moment, by the center-left BASOK, um, decided that Greece could not longer pay its public debt, and therefore it had to proceed into a memorandum of understanding or memorandum as it was known in Greece between uh, the Greek government and uh, 
institutions such as the EU, the European Central Bank, and uh, International Monetary Fund, the IMF, those three came to be known as Troika in Greece, which had its own symbolism. And now what this memorandum of understanding included, primarily it uh, necessitated the restructuring of the financial and uh, economic sector in Greece uh, in the terms uh, in terms that uh, the Greek economy should be orientated towards sustaining its uh, public uh, economics under control and not overspend too much. And on the other hand, to do that, it introduced austerity measures and austerity policies that aimed towards um, social uh, social services cuts, uh, cuts in uh, the healthcare, in education, and in many other areas of uh, public spending. Unavoidably, this decision that was made solely by the Greek government, but it was brought into parliament for voting, the to enter the memorandum of agreement, uh, divided the Greek political scene into two uh, opposing camps. The pro-memorandum forces that stated that it is necessary for Greece to take these steps and not overspend anymore and try to control its finances. And there were the anti-memorandum camp uh, where they were the political forces and of course, members and parts of society stated that uh, austerity policies are undermining our living, are undermining um, our democracy because these decisions are not made without our consent and they even uh, undermining our very own existence as a nation some would uh, say and so you could see that there was this kind of um, the beginning of this polarization uh, sort of thing between these two camps uh, Syriza was uh, part of the anti-memorandum camp from, of course, a left-wing perspective that stated that uh, austerity measures are, uh, are deteriorating uh, Greek living standards, uh, they undermining healthcare services, uh, they're undermining uh, the welfare state, the Greek welfare state, and they were promoting that uh, aspect of um, anti-memorandum struggle. And of course, that camp was having different variations. There were a lot of social struggles, protests against the austerity measures at the time, uh, a lot of initiatives that were uh, aiming to, to act against any memorandum decision that the government of PASOK was uh, scheduled to take. Uh, and the most prominent of those struggles was the squares movement, uh, or as it was known in Greece as Aganaktismeni. I think the most the most familiar element to you would be the Occupy movement, which practically uh, both of these movements have the same roots. Um, and the Squares movement was uh, a non-partisan uh, movement that started talking about how uh, these uh, the memorandum was undermining our national and popular sovereignty, uh, that the mainstream parties at the time, including the government of PASOK and the center-right part of New Democracy, that they could no longer represent uh, the people, that they were detached uh, from the people and the people's needs. And actually, Syriza um, found the opportunity to uh, address these demands, address these concerns, and it did so through an understanding of the whole sociopolitical context through the lens of a populist discourse. That meant that for Syriza, and especially how it was uh, articulated in its discourse, there were the people, all those people that were against the memorandum, that they had uh, serious concerns, um, about uh, how austerity measures and the memorandum affected their way of life, affected their living standards. And all those were unrepresented and detached uh, from the elite who seemed to act 
on its own, and it included the political uh, mainstream parties of Greece, EU and uh, IMF institutions, uh, officials from EU that uh, in Syriza's eyes dictated what Greeks should do and what should, do, should not. And of course, that, uh, as you can imagine, uh, and as history showed afterwards, resonated with a lot of people. Um, of course, this led uh, gradually to Syriza's breakthrough in the double elections of 2012. Uh, in the May elections, uh, it is important to state that the party system became so fragmented that no party managed to gain more than 18%. Uh, so within that context, Syriza got from the 4%, 5% that it had in 2009, it managed to gain 16%, almost quadrupling its, uh, its uh, voter percentage. Of course, this was seen as a major uh, breakthrough, uh, of course, on behalf of Syriza, but also uh, on, uh, from the people who seem to, seem to have found a new party that would appeal to their demands, that would listen to their concerns, and that could very well um, represent them in the parliament and maybe uh, become, uh, form its own government after a point. Of course, no, since there was no clear winner, you need at least uh, 38 or 40, around 40% to form um, a government of your own for a party in Greece. Uh, of course, there was no winner, so new elections had to be announced, and these could happen on the 17th of June 2012. Of course, Syriza's breakthrough did not go unnoticed. That meant that pro memorandum forces, both in Greece and those outside of um, uh, outside of Greece in Europe and the international uh, institutions stated that Syriza's ideas were dangerous, that Syriza was a radical left party who promoted uh, like the nationalization of the economy. They wanted uh, a national currency return to the national currency of drachma and that they wanted uh, Europe, uh, Greece out of Europe and uh, out of EU and out of the euro currency. They weren't entirely wrong. And what I mean by that is that since Syriza was a very plural party with different voices, there were voices in Syriza at that time that were uh, promoting a return to the national currency, that they were anti-EU, uh, they were always anti-EU. And it, again, this kind of polemic on behalf of the pro memorandum camp brought again the issue of how Syriza balanced uh, its own identity with uh, the populist discourse to, uh, that appealed to the Greek society. Uh, of course, it takes two to tango, as they say. So that polarization worked in two ways. On the one hand, uh, it rallied people behind Syriza who saw that these elites actually attack Syriza, so uh, Syriza must, something must be doing right. And of course, it rallied the pro memorandum cup as well. So on the 17th uh, of June elections, Syriza got 26.4%, if I'm not mistaken. And the New Democracy, set the right party, got uh, 29%. New Democracy and PASOK and a smaller um, center-left party called DIMAR back then formed the government of their own coalition government. So it left, uh, so Syriza was left to act as the main uh, parliamentary opposition uh, in Greece. Of course, uh, the aftermath of Syriza's electoral victory was uh, crucial for how the party would uh, resonate and perhaps mediate uh, its intra-party voices that ranged from pro-EU to anti-EU, from um, social, democr uh, social democratic forces to social movements and, uh, let's say, orthodox Marxists. So uh, Syriza had to face a question of how 
fighter if it would become a part of the mainstream and appeal to uh, to a broader audience, or if it would if it would keep its own identity and uh, focus and strengthen uh, its own core electorate, let's say. Of course, again, uh, this uh, dilemma was also reflected into how the party uh, aimed to balance populist discourse and the radical left political program. And the discourse that focused on the people versus the elite continued even after Syriza's breakthrough. But the radical left political program started to take a different form. And by radical left political program uh, in Greece at that time, we're talking about sort of what uh, perhaps a, a little bit of more radical form of what Bernie Sanders say, to give you an example. Uh, at that moment, though, and at that point in time, uh, there were people in Greece who were actually prone to that, who did not want uh, neoliberal reforms to take place, who did not want um, the state to have less responsibilities in healthcare, education, and other sectors. And even there were voices that were pro nationalizing parts of industry, of the economy, if that would mean that the austerity policies would end. So Syriza had to, uh, to face that challenge and it tried to broaden its appeal in the meantime and um, let's say uh, take advantage of the momentum that it had until that point. Of course, that uh, was successful. Syriza managed to win the European Parliament election of 2014 and became the first radical left party to win that election. And since that point, uh, Syriza, uh, it, it kind of became almost common knowledge that Syriza would form a government at one point or another in, in the near future. That near future came uh, sooner than may the Pro Memorandum Cup may have expected. Because on December of 2014, um, a minor, let's say, parliamentary crisis erupted because uh, every five years, the Greek parliament uh, come uh, together to, uh, to elect the president of the Hellenic Republic, which is a mostly a ceremonial role. And if the parliament fails to do that after three consecutive times, there has to be a new parliament uh, to be elected again, to, for Greece to go to elections, to elect a new parliament, to elect new MPs, to vote for the president of the Hellenic Republic. So that kind of crisis happened in uh, December 2014, and it led to uh, the announcement of elections on January 20th, 2015, uh, where uh, Syriza, managed to uh, win the majority of votes. Again, it was, I think, 36%, if I'm not mistaken. Still, uh, as I told you before, it could not form a government of its own. So uh, the party collaborated with another anti-memorandum, although radical right-wing party, that of independent Greeks or ANEL. And uh, they, proceeded into a coalition government on the basis that they were both against the memorandum, that they both wanted to protect popular and national sovereignty uh, of the Greek people, and that on the platform also that they, if elected, uh, they would renegotiate the terms of the memorandum and uh, appeal to EU institutions for a milder, let's say, memorandum with not so severe austerity measures. Uh, some of you may recognize the guy here, which is Yamis Varoufakis. Uh, he was on the spotlight during that period. And that period uh, was a little bit of tumultuous uh, at that time. Because, as I mentioned, uh, one of the first um, goals for the new government was to renegotiate the memorandum. 
And of course, that was an action that was um, hailed by a lot of Greek people. In the first uh, few months, uh, Tsipras, um, reputation, Tsipras popularity, sorry, uh, soared up to almost 70% and almost unprecedented um, popularity during that period for any other uh, prime minister. And they wanted to, the government wanted to renegotiate the terms of the memorandum. There were continuous discussions with uh, EU uh, institutions, with EU officials uh, about how that could happen. Of course, uh, EU was rather, um, they weren't backing down. They weren't very eager to change anything on the uh, agreement. They were constantly saying that these are the rules. This is what you have signed. This is what you must follow. And of course, this started to wear down the Greek government, who appeared to taking steps back from its initial promises about changing the terms of the memorandum. But of course, this uh, led, of course, to the 5th of July referendum of 2015, where the, let's say, the renewed proposal uh, that EU uh, had at the table uh, was brought for discussion and eventually for the decision to be made by the Greek uh, people directly. Uh, on the late late June 2015, uh, Tsipras announced that a memorandum will be held, and uh, for the Greek people to decide whether whether they wanted this new agreement by EU or not. Of course, this became uh, the point where we saw the crystallization of the two different camps: the pro memorandum and anti memorandum camp with the problem Radom Camp saying that it's not, we shouldn't even be discussing this. We should vote yes on their proposal. We should follow what they have to, uh, what they have proposed so far. And any other um, option uh, does not exist at all. On the other hand, there was the no camp, which said no to, the, to that agreement. Of course, in that camp was the government itself. So it was very interesting to see uh, the government, the two parties having a more formal uh, role and yet um, supporting uh, anti-memorandum thesis. Uh, and of course, it wasn't just about that. Uh, the memorandum in each camp uh, represented different um, different ideas about what the referendum was actually about. So you would see in the pro-memorandum cup that there were people that, um, let's say, translated the referendum as a referendum of the, either the Greece should be in or out of Euro. Uh, and of course, something similar happened on the anti-memorandum camp as well. And to be uh, conscious about it, there were a lot of different meanings overlapping about what the referendum actually was. Um, surprise, surprisingly for many, uh, no camp won uh, by 62%. And it, it became almost too unexpected even to the government itself, who were almost certain that the yes camp would win. And that brought the government into a more difficult place. Uh, of course, now that uh, the people, the Greek people had voted against uh, the new agreement, um, something peculiar happened because uh, Syriza knew that they had to follow that mandate, let's say. But on the other hand, they could not. Because even if the potential of Greece leaving the euro or the EU uh, was posed by many pro-memorandum EU officials, 
uh, Syriza did not want to endanger that. So practically, to put it very bluntly, Syriza did a 180 on the assistance. And they said that we disagree with the memorandum, uh, but it is our responsibility as Greek government to follow the rules that uh, were agreed on. And we will do whatever we can in our power to try to tone down the negative effects that it had in the Greeks, on the Greek society. Of course, that created conflict within the party uh, and led to many, to the exit of many people from uh, the anti-memorandum cap that said that, okay, Syriza was betraying its, uh, practically the reasons that brought him up to this place. And the, by the exit of, uh, people from Syriza, I'm talking about almost 40 MPs that resigned, uh, which they went on to form uh, their own uh, very short-lived uh, party. It also, that uh, Syriza's move, uh, it also showed and practically exhausted the pro and data memorandum uh, division in the Greek society, because now there was no practically an anti-memorandum camp represented by any major political force. And under that, under these developments, Syriza uh, announced again elections for uh, the 20th of September 2015. And it also proved the opportunity for Syriza to reinterpret its populist discourse. Um, almost almost diverting from uh, the discourse that it had during the previous period, uh, Syriza was trying to talk about uh, the people who were uh, coming to the election to decide if they were going forward with the new Syriza and Anel who were, who would uh, make a better management of the memorandum than the mainstream parties or the old, referring to the mainstream parties, the old practices, political corruption, and those hardcore pro-memorandum forces. Uh, in short, the populist discourse was still there, but it seemed to change form. That, of course, um, that of course led to, an, to the second series of NNL government, because the people were um, were willing to to say that okay we had we held the referendum we saw that there was no other way possible we should give them a second chance um, of course this would be the the longest living government of the even for of the memorandum era in Greece um, it did not uh, come up with uh, out any friction between the two partners as I said. Uh, Syriza, um, Syriza was a radical left party or a social democratic at that point, let's say, and Anel was a radical right party. Each party had its own agendas, each party appealed to different electorates, and each party uh, had their own policies in their mind to implement the government. That, of course, meant problems, uh, some minor, maybe, problems. Uh, throughout the period of 2015 up until 2019, where Syriza had the opportunity to, to implement, of course, the memorandum, but also to try to promote uh, more social policies, to, uh, to provide, to provide uh, citizenship for immigrants, uh, LGBTQ rights uh, for parts of Greek society. So it was trying to promote uh, its left-wing identity through its government policies. But on the other hand, of course, the party had to uh, promote memorandum policies, austerity measures, uh, uh, and uh, adjusted fiscal policy as well. And on the other hand, Anel, being a, right, a radical right uh, party in Greece, was more prone into, um, into let's say, uh, 
providing a nationalist face for the government in the sense that the party was resonating with uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, the army, uh, the police, uh, the law and order, let's say, um, mandate that it was partly elected on. And of course, the friction was that, for example, Syriza tried to uh, to detach uh, Greek, uh, the Greek state from uh, the Greek Orthodox Church because there's no official separation, there's no actual separation between them, and that, of course, was meant uh, was uh, opposed by Anel, who said that Greek Orthodox Church is part of our DNA, it's part of our tradition. We cannot separate that. And of course, there was some uh, backlash uh, from Anel uh, on Syriza's, uh, Syriza's decision to promote LGBTQ rights. So you would see that this uh, take, took place almost in the entirety of the four-year period in government. Uh, there are two instances here that should be mentioned as there were the main um, the highlights, let's call them, of that period. Uh, the first was the end of the memoranda, where in 2018, uh, Tsipras announced that Greece had stopped being uh, extremely and severely supervised by institutions on how its economy would progress. And while it was not technically the fact that Greece was out of memoranda, it was presented as such, and the the heavy, let's say, the heavy restrictions were lifted, and but not all of the restrictions were lifted. That was one, the one instance. And the other one was the Prespes Agreement, which was an agreement between the Greek government, the North Macedonian government, on the name on the uh, of the name of that country and what should it be? Because in Greece, there was this decades long conflict about how North Macedonia uh, was named Macedonia by itself. And that meant that they were claiming, uh, they had claims on the Macedonia region in Greece as well. Uh, so this uh, created a lot of conflicts uh, over the years. and. Tsipras uh, managed to resolve by agreeing on the North Macedonian name that our neighbors uh, should use. Of course, uh, that uh, with Anel being a very traditional right-wing party was stating that the Macedonian name only belongs to Greece. No one else should use it. And after some, um, let's say initially they seem to passively accept it, accept Syriza's decisions to, uh, to proceed with the Prespes agreement. Uh, but on January 2019, uh, Anel decided to withdraw its support from the coalition government. And that was practically the end of uh, their collaboration uh, based on that. And of course, based on the fact that supposedly memoranda period has ended, there was no reason for us to be partners anymore since we were both anti-memorandum, but we implemented and finished the memorandum of understanding. Um, Syriza was, uh, was practically left alone government for a few months and uh, on the road uh, to the double elections of 2019, uh, the party managed to regain uh, the trust of uh, the Greek electorate because there were the European parliamentary uh, elections of May. And then uh, after Syriza's uh, loss in, the, in that election, uh, Tsipras announced legislative elections for the early July 2019. Uh, you would probably wondering why I haven't mentioned uh, any populist elements of that period. And that's very interesting because uh, during that period, the coherence of the populist discourse and the presence of it 
uh, started to diminish. You would often see in parliament that there were some instances where uh, Tsipras uh, and other members from Syriza resorted to a populist discourse from a different uh, perspective now. Uh, but it did not have the same continuity as before. Of course, this brings us back to the double elections 2018. This changed a little bit, and uh, Tsipras started to address again the Greek audience in a populist discourse, this time talking uh, about the many who had to choose uh, for the needs of the many and not the few. The few, again, were the old mainstream parties. There were EU institutions in some instances uh, and EU officials, some EU officials uh, at the time. Uh, of course, though, the whole pro and anti memorandum uh, division that Syriza's populist discourse was based on, it had exhausted itself a long time ago. So it possibly, and many scholars say that it's one of the reasons that uh, this was one of the reasons why Syriza lost both the elections, because in the elections of July 2019, Syriza lost to New Democracy, the center-right New Democracy, which managed to form a government of its own by winning 38.9% of the vote. Of course, uh, that um, led to a new era for Syriza, uh, and of course, in sort of an existential crisis, because he, Syriza had to face the questions that a party faces when they step down from the government, and having that experience, uh, how do you proceed into promoting something new, something original, or even something that is perhaps anti-establishment? So on this instance, uh, Syriza started to continue a little bit in the first few months of its new oppositional role to talk a little bit about the many and the few, but that could not on its own solve uh, the problem that Syriza was facing as a party, what kind of party it wanted to be. Would it resort back to becoming a radical left party uh, or a main social democratic party or even a main center left party in Greece? Uh, it continued to, uh, to opposing uh, the New Democracy's uh, government in every instance because New Democracy was elected on a very uh, neoliberal program with privatizations, uh, with um, tax cuts, uh, everything else that we've known from a neoliberal program. And Syriza was uh, constantly against that, but it seemed to be lacking its own stigma and proposing how to proposing political alternatives. Uh, of course, this happened in the first few months, and after a while, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic happened, and um, Syriza initially had some reservations about how the uh, how it should be dealt with, the pandemic should be dealt with uh, by the Greek government, but eventually uh, proceeded to an oppositional ceasefire uh, and, sta and stated that the best way to address the pandemic right now, we're talking about the first few months uh, at the moment, uh, the best way for the government to address that pandemic is to close everything down. So initially, Syria seemed to be in agreement with the government and trust the government on its decisions about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. But of course, uh, that would not uh, stay like that forever. And especially after a new democracy's mismanagement of the COVID uh, pandemic, especially after the autumn of 2020, 
Syriza started again to actively talk against the government, although still had problems with finding its own identity, and finding practically uh, proposing a new political alternative to what new democracy was doing at that, at that time. And it continued, the party continued to do so uh, throughout the duration of uh, 2021. Uh, Syriza, all this period, appears to have abandoned any populist discourse. Uh, at least if it's there, it's not in a, in let's say, in a very constant way as it was with previous periods, perhaps. Um, but it's still trying to present itself as a credible political alternative to neoliberal uh, their neoliberal program of new democracy and opposes the government's decision at every possible uh, point. Of course, uh, that leaves a question of uh, what happens now with uh, the Ukraine crisis, uh, the, Ukraine, the war on Ukraine, sorry for that. Um, Syriza is uh, trying to have a more let's say, a diplomatic role uh, and address the crisis in a more diplomatic way than new democracy. Uh, but that, of course, it's open to interpretation from, depending on who you ask in Greece. And uh, because, for example, uh, new democracy is fervently pro-EU, uh, pro, uh, pro-Ukraine, and Syriza is saying that we are pro-Ukraine, of course, but we should play a more diplomatic role and not act aggressively in any manner. Uh, of course, that's been reinterpreted in many different ways in Greece, but we can discuss this in the questions further, or if you want. So that was it pretty much. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm more than open to address any of you the questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Lazarus. Uh, it was um, fascinating as you walked us through to some of the most important periods of recent Greek politics. And I would uh, actually think that those um, are exemplar for, um, uh, for processes that were going uh, within uh, pan-European politics, but also marked for um, uh, market examples for uh, the so-called populism theory look no further of the attention of uh, scholars of populism that uh, have paid attention, at least in our field in political science. So um, uh, at this, I certainly have questions and I have at least three of them, but I will uh, ask Dr. Newberger to open the session for Q&A so you can have uh, get... a little bit of water and uh, <laughs> so we can go on to the discussion. Dr. Newberger. Yes, um, and I encourage people to raise their hands, but I also have some questions. I guess I'll just throw a few at you. Um, so one, I wanna hear a little bit more about the PRESPA agreement and how damaging that was, I suppose, <laughs> to Syriza to sign that. But what's interesting is it was so unpopular in Macedonia as well, <laughs> um, but yet they both signed it. Um, and anyway, and it hasn't gotten us very far in terms of North Macedonia. So a little bit more about the effect of that. And then I'm also just interested in this idea of, um, I guess, populism, populists aligning who are from the far left and far right, and how does that work? And particularly um, the fact that um, Syriza also was, I don't know, like what was their sort of relationship to both Trump and Putin in this period? Um, because I think they came across as kind of Trump friendly and Putin friendly in the press somehow. Anyway, so those are kind of huge questions and they're, they're pretty superficial, but anything you want to say about that to get us started? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so with the Prespes Agreement, um, Syriza was perceived, especially by the... Uh, let me start again. Okay, the Greek society was primarily against 
any name that the neighbors would use that included Macedonia. Okay, and uh, in that, uh, Anel was, the funny thing is that Anel started off with that issue on its flag, but when it was in government, it, it was awfully quiet about it when the whole Prespos agreement was going on. So uh, these, let's say, nationalist elements uh, in the Greek society were, uh, new democracy managed to exploit them and say that Greece is selling the name to the neighbors. Simple as that, and Syriza is selling Macedonia. It was framed like that. Uh, of course, that rallied a lot of people on the from the center right up until the far right. Uh, but uh, Syriza actually tried to promote it as something that would lead to the better collaboration between oh, the countries. We're trying to have a sorry. Um, sorry, that was I just muted. That was somebody. One of the other people in the room was unmuted for a second there, and something was going on in the background, but I just muted them. So, so go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, no worries. Uh, so, uh, Syriza was promoting a press agreement as a way of the two countries collaborating uh, to have a better collaboration in the future, to put an end to that old feud uh, between them. And um, of course, uh, leave the whole issue at rest after almost 30 years. Um, yeah, some people say that it costed perhaps Syriza's election, but there are a lot of uh, interpretations about Syriza's losing the 2019 elections. That may have contributed up to a certain extent, absolutely. Uh, you said about the populist uh, left and right wing populists, how they align together. Uh, this was very interesting because I got the opportunity in my PhD to discuss with some people from Syriza and from Anel. And all of them agreed that it's the issue that transcended both uh, of us was that we were against the memoranda. This was the, the basis, the, the core, the practically only core of uh, their collaboration uh, and the the coalition government, so that they were against the memoranda, that they wanted to put an end to memoranda. And this is what Anel also claimed after they left the government, is it was that we met our goal, we ended the memoranda, we have no longer common interests with Syriza. So we're out of the government. Uh, it happened on that basis, and it was, when I asked some people from Anel, they told me that it was just that we did not agree on a lot of stuff out there than that. Um, and now about Trump and Putin. The funny thing is that an, the Anel party was uh, majorly pro-Putin and pro-Russia. And even in the referendum, they were stating that, okay, if we go out of the EU, we're gonna borrow from Russia, which is easier said than done uh, at that moment. So. I think Syriza was uh, more level-headed about uh, its appeal to, it wasn't hardcore pro-Putin. They were trying to uh, be, to keep the diplomatic uh, relationships between Greece and Russia through that context. Of course, and as a minor note here, there are people within Syriza that were very hardcore pro-Putin. But there were very, very few, very few. Not they did not have any important role in the government uh, decision making. And about Trump, um, I don't think it was, if I remember correctly, I don't think it was very, um, very well respected. Let's say by either Syriza or Anel, but. It was respected as head of the United States and as our traditional ally, the United States, we should have as uh, best relationships with them as possible. Uh, I think it, it, would, it would be very interesting to say that uh, I think Putin played a, major, a more major role than Trump throughout that period because uh, Putin also, Putin and Russia, you know, 
they had they symbolized also maybe some sort of uh, Soviet Union. The, they had that tradition, which resonated with some people within Syriza. So yeah, but Trump was like uh, everybody dislikes Trump, so <laughs> it was like that <laughs> at that moment. But yeah. Thank you, Lazarus, for this. Uh, again, I'll keep my uh, more kind of theoretical questions probably towards the end. Uh, so because you have raised questions from the editorial, we'll start addressing them by uh, the people raising hands. So first of all, Nuri, hello. Uh, we're glad to have you in the circle again. Uh, is it uh, from Turkey or from elsewhere that you're, Colin? It is done yesterday, so for a few days and we'll go back. Okay, so uh, please address your question, Nuri. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Lazarus, for this fascinating uh, presentation because like, I followed the developments uh, with Syriza for a very long period. And I would like to ask you just a question. Since Alexis uh, Tsipras being the first, perhaps, uh, prime minister who refused to swear on Bible uh, in the parliament, and it was quite interesting for me to see how the Greek... Uh, a youth was uh, experiencing the university life because if you enter the buildings of the University of Athens and Thessaloniki, you could uh, basically think that all the Greek youth is communist. I mean, because with the banners uh, on the walls of uh, all the faculties and all these uh, different, uh, let's say, um, flyers that they are distributing, one would uh, think so. And I believe actually that uh, for sure, they have changed also because of these uh, examples you have given about the LGBT rights and the uh, true, uh, that uh, it somehow uh, managed to resolve some of the main issues of the contemporary Greek society, perhaps, because these were the really contentious topics. Oh, Nuri, you're cutting out. Yep. Oh, so now it's okay? Yeah, Yeah, we just missed the end there, I think. Uh, telling that, um, so he really made some moves uh, where actually were quite contentious topics for the Greek Orthodox Church, who was seen as the natural defender of the state generally. So, but in this respect also, they, uh, he really didn't hesitate to act uh, against them and uh, managed to solve at least, I mean, the Macedonian uh, issue too, uh, with the Prespa agreement. However, uh, I, I do think that this was also a change with the traditional Greek national, uh, let's say, uh, nationalism in some uh, way, kind of like, you know, distancing itself from the Greek Orthodox Church, if you don't see it in the previous political leaders. So do you think, uh, how do you actually comment on that issue? Because this was a move that was not seen from other political parties, even at least in the side of PASO, for instance, uh, despite being a leftist party, but, you know, Syriza case is a totally different one. Uh, and do you think also that this type of uh, distancing itself from the Orthodox Church, uh, uh, let's say, uh, fall in the votes of Syriza? Um. Yeah, uh, let me see if I got this uh, correctly. So, the Tsipras is not vo not uh, giving an oath, uh, uh, not giving a, a religious oath uh, in parliament, and when he was elected the government, uh, the party was always like that. I mean, they were they. I think they left. Uh, they left it up to MPs to you know decide what kind of oath they wanted to give. Uh, but, well, seeing it for the first time happen, uh, it was a little bit of a minor shock for many. It was like, oh, he's not uh, doing a Greek Orthodox uh, oath. Okay, that's new. Uh, and it was, it was. Uh, but there were some people uh, that were like, okay, finally, you know, he, he didn't have to, regardless of... Uh, it was his constitutional right to say that I want to do a political oath and not a religious oath. And yeah, uh, so the Greek Orthodox Church knew that. So there weren't many surprises at that moment by them. I'm going to jump to the last question and then address the universities one. Uh, 
yeah, I mean, against uh, Syriza, in some instances, went against uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, especially with LGBTQ rights. Uh, there was, of course, backlash. It wasn't taken kindly by them. And of course, that was uh, in a paradoxical kind of way. They were aided by Anel, who were like, yeah, we don't like that either. So, uh, but yeah, especially especially also in the Prespice Agreement, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church was hardcore against it. You could not find, I don't think I've seen anyone from the church and my uncle is a priest as well. So I don't think I've seen anyone who was like uh, in favor of that, to be honest. But the focus was given more, let's say, to the nationalist elements on that rather than to, uh, to put it differently, the Greek Orthodox Church did not have a very uh, crucial role in that. They had a very basic, maybe even core one, but not the crucial role. They weren't leading the whole uh, anti-Prespice agreement, let's say, movement. Um, and uh, regarding the universities about being communist, can you rephrase that to see if I understood correctly? I mean, how it ties in with the rest of the of the of your questions? I can. We can hear you. Oh, yep. Can you try again, please? Let's say uh, kind of or okay. um, I'm from the youth, or I don't know if there is any data about behavior of the Greek citizens. So from whom uh, they are getting those votes? Because I could see that, you know, when you look at the universities, basically, I mean, the university students were doing this austerity measures the years I spent in Greece from my, my 2011 until 2014, basically observe what was the change. So this is uh, how I have seen the situation because they were, there was quite a lot of, of course, uh, against austerity measures, but they were usually blaming PASOK for that. Um, and uh, of course, Syriza was uh, somehow taking the support from it. That's why I wanted to say, because also like, you know, there was this uh, type of connection. Um, yeah, I mean, as I was also in the university, the Greek, in the Arsenal University of Greece from 2008 to 2015, can you imagine? I saw the whole thing. So, yeah, and yeah, the blame was uh, the blame was primarily on PASOK at that time, but it was also on mainstream parties. I mean, a lot of people, uh, I'm going to rephrase that. The, let's say the youth movement and the, what we call, we call it the youth movement or the undergrad movement in Greece, uh, quote unquote, yeah. And um it has been at the forefront of any anti-government protest since the 60s, maybe in the, the, the 50s. Okay, so in this instance, it was uh, also again at the forefront, and they were against uh, PASOK at that moment, but they were not all of them like pro series or something. There was... Syriza had momentum within that uh, group, absolutely. Uh, but it was very uh, fragmented, to be honest. I mean, you could, you could still see a lot of people that were pro-PASOK. Uh, PASOK is still one of the main, um, let's, uh, to, to give you an understanding, one of the most favorable uh, parties within the universities because each party has its own organizations, its own unions, let's call them, within the universities. Yeah. So PASOK still resonates highly They're with, uh, sorry? They're embedded, embedded. In yeah, the... yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And the same goes with new democracy. And this is a funny thing because Syriza never had serious roots established in the universities like PASOK had in the past, since the eighties or something because this is when people start to resonate with PASOK and these roots are still there in one form or another. Uh, so it was a very, oh, it was a colorful picture. A lot of uh, youth people, a lot of young ones were against, of course, any austerity measures at all. Uh, there was a lot of protests, a lot of tear gas, to be honest. Uh, it, it was 
quite interesting at that moment. But again, the support to Syriza, yes, but not their embedment with Syriza as one and the same. It never happened. Thank you, Lazarus, for addressing this. Thank you, Nuri, for the comments and the questions. And actually, I do appreciate, you know, I just realized that you are not at your usual place in the connection, maybe, you know, but, you know, you're expanding the geography of the circle, you know, so as far as I'm concerned, that makes me happy each Friday. Uh, let's, uh, uh, Lazarus, let's open the question for, or try to answer the question that was posed by our colleague at uh, the department, Dr. Maria Sidorkina. Maria, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for, I've you know, always wanted to know the details of this interesting story. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, um, but I'm curious how, uh, I guess, you're thinking about populism other than by identifying this figure of the people. You know, there's a lot of talk about what populism means. Um, and it's a pretty thin ideology. Lots of people in any right and anywhere can describe themselves as populist and just by saying that they have this figure of the people uh, i'm curious what if that's all that it is you know doing um and um i guess my question is did, did does this idea of you calling them populist does it actually meaningfully distinguish series's rhetoric from that of other parties or are they all appealing to the people in some respect or instead, are they actually not? And are they appealing to like class or families or business owners as the subjects that they're representing? And I guess I'm also curious, you really talk about populist discourse. It seems like this is a rhetorical analysis you're making and you're saying that the rhetoric has changed. Sometimes it's more populist, sometimes less. And does this actually link to kind of different policy recommendations or attempts or why why would it have changed from being more to less populist um, otherwise thank you thank you these were actually i was hoping for these kind of questions because as you can imagine the covering that uh, kind of 15 year span for syriza you cannot include everything so Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address this. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, for me, populism is, um, it's not a thin ide ideology as uh, Cosmo has most prominently issued, but it's, I'm gonna put it as a political logic. I'm more with the Ernesto Laclau camp and the, um, discourse theory, understanding, uh, discursive understanding of populism. And I see it as a way uh, of doing politics. It's just another form of doing politics that focuses on the people, the elite, and their, how their ju juxtaposition defines the sociopolitical field. Uh, within that, what I try to do in my research, and perhaps I should give more emphasis on the presentation, was that uh, as you said, what distinguishes that discourse from, let's say, talk about the nation, talk about the business owners, talk about class. Uh, I think uh, that the main factor for distinguishing that is not who the people are exclusively, it's very much so that, but also who the elite are. Okay, we, we, we talk in the name of the people and that people can take many forms. It can be the nation, can be the class, but of course, if it's nation, if it's class, they tend to exclude some people, right? Some people do not belong to that class. Some people do not belong to that nation. Uh, and for me, the elite can add as a better, a, for, a more improved qualifying factor for saying that, okay, we have these people and we don't seem to understand who these people are. And if you see the populist literature, the literature of populism actually, almost exclusively revolves about who are the people, who is the people, uh, but none talks about the elite. So I, I see that it's not how much, how you define the, the people, but how you define the elite. If, for example, the elite is uh, almost exclusively understood in economic terms, then you probably not do not have uh, populism also if the people you're talking about is a social class. You have something else perhaps. 
or the same with the nation. If you're talking about the enemies of the nation or the people who want to, to harm the nation against the national community, then you probably have nationalism. Of course, these distinctions are not very clear uh, always, right? So this is why I did discourse analysis in my research and that trying to find the differentiating degrees of when we have, let's say, the populist logic more prevalent in understanding the sociopolitical reality. And when another logic takes over, that would be uh, nationalist logic or socialist or radical left logic in the case of Syriza. So this is why I stated in my presentation that we have periods of intense crisis where the populist logic in Syriza took over and became the main logic under Syriza expressed, under which Syriza expressed itself. And we have other instances where, especially during its governmental period, where the populist logic, let's say, took a back seat and a more professional, let's say, almost technocratic logic uh, uh, took over. Um, yeah, so I also think I uh, answered that I did not do rhetorical analysis as you may uh, mean it. I did it a more discourse analysis originating from the Essex School of Political Thought, Laclau stuff. <laughs> so yeah, I hope you, I answered your questions. If not, let me know if I missed something. Thank you, Lazarus. Maria, any follow-up questions or comments? Uh, no, I mean, I think, I guess, what, what is that? Discourse analysis of, of party speeches. You're just looking yes. at how they talked about the elites, essentially, and comparing that across time and whether they identified elites. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, elites and the people. Yeah. I, I would say that still is, you know, I, I don't know if I would make this, you know, uh, uh, Leclau, I think, would, would, would say that any, any functional articulation of the subject that brings back a new kind of right political subject, uh, sort of right, creates new alliances and collectivities is essentially this, right, assembling this new group. It doesn't have to talk about elites. Like I know that, you know, MOVE sometimes says that the figure of the enemy kind of we're borrowing from the right to do that. And, and that's important, uh, but, you know, it could really be pretty wide. And I guess my, my question is, are you saying that this changes in discourse, just that you're setting, you're pinging them to moments of crisis, or are there also different kinds of like political crisis and like electoral crisis, or are you saying it's actually linked to what they're doing as a party? Sorry, yeah, thanks. Uh, no worries. I mean, I'm happy to, to discuss this even further. Uh, it's, um, I never stated that like Klaus said uh, about the elite, although I think we'll find some, some parts in some of his books and articles about that. But what I'm saying is that something, at least in my understanding, is that that should be also brought into attention. This is what I try to do in my research. Of course, you have political subject that yes, can take many forms. And this is also a debatable point for me, at least that, okay, we have the people and how do we define the people in its most abstract sense? right, when we're talking about the people. So we see there, we're talking about their people and the elite. I believe that we see populism in its most abstract sense and that allows for its flexibility. That allows also for, uh, sorry, my laptop is going to die down. Uh, that allows for its flexibility. Uh, that allows for the incorporation of many different groups to be associated with one or another. And I I see that when we have that, it transcends social or class or national divisions. And I think at some point, Syriza went towards that direction. Uh, and others, uh, in other instances, the party didn't. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that of course uh, would mean that what Laclau said that every politics is populism because we always have a people in the, an elite. Debatable, I'm willing to discuss it. I'm initially rejecting that, but I'm willing to discuss it. 
Lazarus, thank you. And I'm so glad actually that uh, Maria brought up, you know, because I was itching, you know, to go into this, uh, you know, nuts and bolts, you know, because of this fascinating story. And if you allow me, I'm just going to ask you like, uh, to, because we're running almost out of time, I don't see hands, but I, I just want to add something to what Maria was uh, talking about and ask you for like three blitz answers, blitz you know, based on the research, what you're doing. So first of all is what are the distinct features of Greek, uh, Greek left-wing populism uh, in comparison with other populisms? Uh, and again, I'm, I, I do completely understand and I'm glad that uh, you've illustrated, you know, the, uh, and build off from Maria's uh, comments on, on the, you know, Kasmuda's uh, sort of claim on thin ideology versus actually developed distinct ideology and then on to Laclau. So what are the distinct features? If, if you have to say, you know, like what I've learned, you know, from the Syriza's case in those 10 years, what makes it different than, than others? Uh, number two is, what do you consider to be Syriza's most significant achievement, achievement in terms of political innovation, if we take them as an example for uh, political populism? And three, uh, did Syriza trajectory in those 10 years, again, going back to Maria, what she was saying, like in time, right, you know, you, you looked at them over time and their evolution of their rhetoric in this case. Um, uh, did it comply with populism theory, regardless of which one you have chosen as a guide of light, or there was something that was an outlier uh, or a, a novelty that, that you have discovered? Those are kind of like from my perspective, you know, like one anthropological, one political scientist. So can you uh, can you please rephrase the, th the third question because there was some cutoff? So oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, did Syriza's trajectory comply with uh, populism theory that you have chosen? So or you there was something new that you saw, like outlier pattern of their development because you were saying that. Uh, there was um, fluctuation, uh, what uh, Maria was referring to, you know, like in terms of prices, you were seeing oscillation of, of their, you call them logics. So did they comply with, uh, with overall theory, uh, regardless of one, whether you've been following, I think, Laclau rather than Cass uh, or Minkenberg, you know, what, whichever, you know, you have chosen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, yeah, I, I'll try to be as uh, short as possible, although these can, we can talk about uh, for hours about this. Um, the distinct features of left-wing populism in Syriza's case and how it differentiates from other uh, left-wing populism of that time. Uh, that's very interesting because there has been comparative studies and there are, let's say, um, some common agreements about what is left-wing populism. And generally speaking, left-wing populism is uh, when we have uh, a populist discourse that's uh, complemented by a left-wing political program, by uh, being an inclusive instead of an exclusive discourse, as uh, it would happen with the case of right-wing populism. So the main distinction, as of course Mude and Karl Wasser have said, is the inclusion and exclusion. Uh, division. Uh, how Syriza differentiates from others? I would say, of course, depending on what do you compare it with. If you compare it with uh, Bernie Sanders, if you compare it with Jeremy Corbyn, it's very different. Uh, for example, to give you also my personal opinion, but some what other people have said, Bernie Sanders by Greek standards is center left. So yeah, it's the context, of course, that makes uh, its populism unique and perhaps successful or not. Uh, for example, left-wing populism, even by the days of PASOK, because PASOK in its first uh, decade was a, a left-wing populist party, had, uh, let's say, healthy dosage of uh, left-wing nationalism, which is a very interesting example. We also see that in Syriza's case, uh, where there is a left-wing understanding of the nation as primarily a nation of working class people that's against elites that do not want the nation's benefits and do not want the people's benefits. But we also see similar traits in uh, Podemos case in Spain. Uh, I would say that 
the distinctive and the political innovation to go to your second question of Syriza was that it managed to, to bring very different groups together to, um, to create a coherent identity with the help of populist discourse and of course to win the elections because up until today it's the most successful left-wing populist party in Europe. And that's a feature that not a lot of people tend to give it attention to. They mostly give attention that they collaborate with the right-wing populist party. And yes, of course, that's important as well. It's also, uh, let's say, another political innovation because you don't see usually this kind of collaborations even, I don't know, I can't remember any other instance, to be honest, especially in Europe. Uh, so I would say that these couple of things were are the uh, series of political innovations. But again, as I have presented uh, in my talk, the context is important. It, that could not be possible perhaps in Spain or the UK or the United States even. Um, so uh, if Syriza's trajectory and what I saw aligned with political theory, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that it was when I was studying Syriza because when you do a comparative study, you have to jump from one party to another and see what's going on uh, all the time. And uh, with Syriza, it was like a back and forth between theory and practice. Because you see, you have the practice, yes. You have the practice and you try to see if theory corresponds to that and if not, why. And what I want to say is that I the theory provided a very good basis to start the analysis, uh, but I think I diverged from that and went into an in-depth analysis of what the theory had to propose. For example, the fluctuations and the degrees are an important factor. And I saw that when I was studying the material that, hey, we do not have the same uh, populist discourse over that time. It changes, it changes forms. Perhaps, is it still a populist discourse? That was another question that I had to answer. Maybe it becomes something else. Maybe it becomes a technocratic discourse or techn technocratic populism, perhaps. You don't know. So I think I this is lies with what we discussed with Maria before about the elite, that the elite, through that analysis of Syriza, I managed to see that okay, wait a minute, not only the context is important and the people, but also how the elite is signified. Because again, the people are partly, um, they take their form through their opposition to the other, what's not the people. And that's exactly, and that's, all, that's a fact, I think that has been overlooked in uh, populism research overall. Hopefully, I will have some time to focus on that. Okay, and um, maybe just this one last question for Maria in the chat. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry for that. I I forgot to respond to that. Um, crisis, usually we're talking about, uh, especially in the case of populism, we're talking about primarily political crisis or crisis of representation, to put it differently. Uh, meaning that, as you may be aware with Laclau's theory, we're talking about the dislocation of the hegemonic uh, practice at that moment, where practically, to put it in a different way for those who don't know about Laclau, uh, when the established political system or the established party system breaks down, simple as that. Uh, what happened with the 2012 the first elections, for example, that was the quintessential uh, breakdown of the party system until that point, because it was it had a huge impact of uh, any party that could not uh, take more than 18 percent of the vote. Uh, and I think through this crisis, uh, you can see that uh, populism or populist discourse may emerge. The forms that it will take be that left wing or right wing, of course, very. Okay, we can go to France and see what happens with Le Pen, where a different kind of crisis uh, prompted a political uh, representational crisis and led to 
Le Pen becoming an established political figure. Uh, again, the degrees of crisis also vary. And of course, you could not see that uh, even in some cases where there is a complete breakdown, populism uh, may not be successful. It may not even appear. It depends, of course, to other factors that have to do. And may, maybe it depends on the political tradition of populism in that country. For example, to use an example from the States, you could not have Bernie Sanders without the People's Party. There is a tradition. There is the People's Party. There is uh, the New Deal. Uh, there are social movements after that. There are traits that if you study them, you'll find that, hey, there are commonalities here. And I've read, I haven't read, sorry, but I am aware that Thomas Frank has read a book about that, uh, which I hope to read at some point. So. Well, thank you so much. I think we're going to have to wrap up today, but this was a really informative talk. And as a historian, I really like to hear this kind of laying this period as periodizing you know, politics over this 15 years period. And I feel like I really understand Greek politics better. And it's kind of making me think about politics across the Balkans and even globally and in our sort of age of populisms um, and thinking about right and left populism uh, across this region. So I hope this is something we can return to in future Balkan circles. And we welcome you to come as a in our audience and maybe a future talk. So um, I just want to give thank you and give you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>